I am building some beautiful North Texas open country scenery, and I'm using some techniques and some materials that are brand new to me in the process, and I'm going to show you how they work on Ron's Trains and Things right now. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and I've been working off and on for the past several months on a new North Texas scene on the upper deck of the new section of my layout. Now, in previous videos, I've showed you how I conceived of this scene from a reference photo of the area, how I roughed in the terrain, how I cast and painted the rocks, modeled the highway that bisects the scene. Well, today we're going to bring that scene to life with static grass, trees, bushes, shrubs, and a variety of other materials that is going to create an ultra-realistic looking scene that I think you're going to really enjoy. But rather than talk about it, I think we should head on over and get started. This video is brought to you by Midwest Model Railroad. Now with 15,000 square feet and one day shipping, they truly are your one-stop model railroad shop. MidwestModelRR.com, link in the description. When I left off in my previous videos, I had built and painted the scenery base and the rock castings, and I had built and painted the highway. The next step was to glue the highway down to the scene using low temp hot glue. I then masked the track through the scene and the highway itself in preparation for applying Sculpt-A-Mold along the sides of the highway. This material blends the edges of the highway into the surrounding scenery. I mixed my Sculpt-A-Mold to a thick consistency like cottage cheese, applying it with gloved fingers, and then as it began to set up, I used a wet finger to smooth it out as much as possible. If you don't have access to Sculpt-A-Mold in a store near you, it is available on Amazon, and I will include a link to it in the Amazon Pick of the Week in the description down below this video. The Sculpt-A-Mold takes some time to set, as much as a day or two depending on how wet you mix it and how high your humidity levels are. When it had dried completely, I removed the masking tape from the highway. One happy accident occurred when I did. I had applied a railroad crossing decal to the highway, and the masking tape pulled some of the decal off, but I thought the result looked pretty natural like paint wear on the highway, so I left it just as it was. I used a damp paper towel to clean bits of sculpt mold off of the highway. I then lightly sanded the sculpt mold to remove any rough patches. I vacuumed up the debris and then painted the sculpt mold to match the surrounding scenery. For the ground color, I mixed a variety of light brown colors of inexpensive craft paint. The exact color here isn't terribly important as most of this will be covered with other scenery materials. We just want enough color to make sure that no white comes pouring through a hole in the materials. When the paint had dried, and before applying ground cover, I covered the highway with moistened paper towels. This kept materials off the highway without further damaging the decals or the paint on the road. I covered the rock castings in the same way. I then applied real sifted dirt mixed with buff colored unsanded tile grout to make dirt on the scene. I applied it with a plastic jar covered by an old stocking. When the dirt had been applied, I soaked it with isopropyl alcohol with a mister bottle. I then applied scenic glue in the same way until everything was saturated. There are a lot of recipes for scenic glue out there, but I like to use diluted Mod Podge mixed one part Mod Podge to three parts water. I've tried a variety of spray bottles to get this mixture in a fine mist as I apply it, but the glue just seems to clog them up very quickly, so I use a cheap hair mister bottle from the dollar store and try to spray the glue on as indirectly as possible. I spray the glue horizontally and allow it to fall onto the scene. Note here that I have protected the backdrop with waxed paper to keep alcohol and glue off of it. I showed this step in the earlier video, which I will link in an end screen at the end of this video. I completely saturated the scene with glue, then used the edge of a paper towel to absorb glue from areas where it ran and pooled. 
I also sprinkled a bit more dirt in spots that appeared a little too thin. At this point, I took down the wax paper to make sure that no glue had gotten behind it. I also removed the paper towels from the roadway and cleaned up bits of dirt that had run underneath the edges, as well as any glue that found its way through. I also removed the glue-soaked tape from the track. Let me pause here to say that if you enjoy this video and would like to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques, be sure to subscribe to this channel down below the video and click the little bell icon so you can catch future videos. I let the dirt dry and then began applying ground cover. I started by applying some fine ground foam to areas that would hold more water and simulate green undergrowth. In wetter parts of the world, I would apply more of this material, but this is arid North Texas, so I only applied it in patches in low-lying areas. Throughout this process, I vacuum up excess materials with a small vacuum using a stocking over the end to catch extra material for reuse. My reference photo shows that the area is covered in a large, loose rocks. So I applied talus to the area. At this point, it looks a bit like rocks that are just thrown out on the ground, but I'll blend them in with other scenery materials as we go along. I soaked the rocks with isopropyl alcohol and a pipette, and then applied glue to hold them in place. The talus is very porous and tends to drink up thinner scenic glue, so for this step I used a thicker 50-50 mixture of Mod Podge and water. I again soaked up any extra glue with the edge of a paper towel. The very back of the scene will be covered with trees, so I applied some darker, coarse ground cover to that area. This material that I'm using is made up from some of the coarser materials that I sifted out of the real dirt that I collected from my yard. Mostly, it is bits of dried leaves. When I was ready to start applying static grass, I began by working around the rocks. I applied the 3 to 1 scenic glue by stippling it on with a brush. You'll see me use this technique for static grass throughout the process as it leaves grass in clumps that look wild and natural rather than like a manicured carpet of grass. I applied the static grass with my Woodland Scenics Static King grass applicator. I have used several different applicators over the years, but the Static King is hands down the best that I have used. It can be powered with a battery, but is better using its wall power as it has a higher voltage and really makes the grass stand up. I highly recommend the Static King, and I'm going to leave a link to it in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description as well if you'd like to check it out. Once the grass was applied to the glue, I again sucked up the excess grass with a vacuum and a stocking. As I continued to apply grass to the area, let me tell you about my technique for getting very realistic results with static grass. In addition to the stippling of the glue to achieve tufts of grass, I also mix my grass colors and apply the grass in layers. What you see so far is just the first layer of grass. It is comprised of 2 millimeter grass, a 50-50 mixture of sill floor late summer and autumn colors. In some areas, I replaced the late summer grass with knock summer meadow color. The mixture achieves a more realistic color palette for the scene. The shorter grass models the lower, fresher, greener growth of grass. I will later add some taller 4 millimeter grass on top of this layer, but I'll tell you about that whenever we get there. The important thing to note is to only mix grass strands of the same length. I never mix the 2 millimeter and the 4 millimeter with one another. This layering of colors from green to brown and from short to long helps to achieve a very realistic wild grass look that I was looking for. So I just kept applying this short layer of grass. I worked in small areas so the glue didn't dry before I applied the grass. It's also important to keep the ground pin for the applicator in contact with the surface and as close to the applicator as possible to keep the grass standing up. Also, 
keep the screen of the applicator no more than half an inch from the scene, and it is okay, and in fact it's actually good, to leave some areas of bare dirt showing, especially at this early stage of applying grass. Some visible dirt will make a wild field look very realistic, and if too much is showing, you can fill it in later, as you will see. After the first layer of grass was applied, I allowed the entire area to dry overnight, then vacuumed the whole area again very well to remove any loose grass. Now it was time for the next layer of grass. For this, I used 2mm sill floor hay colored grass. This is a duller green with a little more of a brown tint and adds some variety to the color while also tying together the areas that had different colors in the first layer. I again stippled the glue on, but right on top of the shorter grass. I applied the grass more sparsely as I didn't want to cover completely the first layer of grass. I again allowed this layer of grass to dry completely, then came back and applied 4mm sill floor autumn colored grass. This will model the tall brown grasses that have already gone to seed for the season. Obviously, if you're working in larger scales, you'll want to continue with longer fibers, but 4mm in N scale is just over 2 scale feet tall, so this was tall enough for my scene. I still stippled the glue and applied the grass even more sparsely as I wanted the tall grass to be even more clumpy than the layers below. I think you'll notice that this color really begins to show the contrast between the layers and makes the grass look wild and realistic. Once again, I allow the grass to dry thoroughly before moving on. If you work over static grass before it's dried completely, you run the risk of knocking it down and losing that standing grass effect that is what static grass is all about. Now it was time to plant trees. I planted a group of mesquite trees along the backdrop. Now, I often hear conversations about how model trees are too small or too short for their scale. And this is often true, but it's also important to consider the type of trees in the area that you're modeling. North Texas mesquite trees average only 15 to 40 feet in height, so I modeled trees in this height range. These are super trees made from sea foam and coarse ground turf. I made a separate video about how I made these trees, so be sure and check for that. I planted the trees with the taller ones towards the back and the shorter ones in front. I honestly ended up with too much grass underneath the trees, but I hid this with some other scenery materials that you'll see later. To plant the trees, I simply poked a hole in the plaster cloth and foam with my tweezers, dipped the trunk of the tree in some Elmer's PVA glue, and pushed it into place. My reference photo showed a number of larger dead trees and I wanted to model them. For these, I used sagebrush armatures that I collected while vacationing in Colorado. Scenic items like this are best incorporated in odd numbers. For some reason, they just look more natural to the eye that way. I only planted two of these trees here, but as I expand the scene, there will be a third directly across the highway from them. I sprinkled a bit of dead leaf material that I used earlier at the base of the trees to cover any excess glue. At this point, I used some Martin Welberg Scenic Studios products to add more variety to the growth and to fill in some blank areas. I wanted some of the dirt to show in this scene, but not as much as was visible at this point. To fill these areas in more, I used a variety of grass tufts. Specifically, I used fall tufts with weeds, spring tufts with weeds, late summer layered tufts, and fall tufts. I'll list all of these products in the description down below if you'd like to find them. They are available at scenicexpress.com. To glue these in place, I used Beacon 3-in-1 glue. It's one of the adhesives that Martin Welberg himself recommends for his materials. It is easy to use, it has a great applicator tip, and it dries completely clear. Once again, I'll post a link to it in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description. 
For these grass tufts, I simply plucked them from the backing material with a pair of tweezers, tore them to size, and then glued them into place. The most important part is to make sure that you press down or burnish the edges of each piece so that you see the vegetation but not the edge of the tuft. Once pressed into place, the edges disappear into the surrounding scenery and the effect is extremely realistic. I used Welberg burnt green bushes to create wild shrubs along the front of the tree line and scattered some around the grass field as well. These matched wild shrubs that were in my reference photo. I also planted three standout light green bushes. I just kept adding tufts of various colors until I thought the scene looked right. A reference photo helps here, but just make it look right and natural to your own eye. I used some small sagebrush twigs to represent deadfall around the dead trees, as well as some fallen trees along the tree line. I just broke them up until I thought they looked right and glued them in place. To complete the scene, I installed electrical poles and lines along the road. These are Woodland Scenic's utility system pre-wired poles. The poles look really good, but I'll probably restring the wires, perhaps with a different type of material, as these lines go through holes in the poles and the cross arms rather than on the insulators. But I went ahead and installed them temporarily for now, simply making a hole for each pole and pressing them into place without gluing them. Light poles average about 125 feet apart generally, and a minimum of six feet back from a country highway like this. So I made a stick 125 scale feet long and put a mark at six scale feet to help me quickly measure the placement of each pole. I placed my Showcase Miniatures bucket truck into the scene with a couple of safety cones. These are not permanently in place as I'm still working on the area around this bit of scenery, but I set them in place to temporarily get a feel for how this scene is going to look. Eventually, they'll be put permanently into this place along with a couple more line workers and some more cones. This part of the scene is in honor of my son, Nate, who is an electrical lineman and his co-workers who help keep the lights on for us all. Thank you, guys. If you'd like to see how I built this entire scene for my layout, including bench work, backdrops, scenic forms, and this utility truck, I'll post links to all of those videos in the description below. Well, I couldn't be happier with this portion of this scene on the North Texas part of my layout. Now, obviously, I still have a lot of work to do in the surrounding areas, and there will be some more details that will find their way into this portion of the scene as well. But this small piece of scenery is essentially done, and I personally think that it looks fantastic and really, really realistic. Now, the materials and the techniques that I've used here in this scene make scenery building really, really easy. And with just a little experimentation and some practice, you can build ultra-realistic scenery as well. Now, be sure and look for the Static King grass applicator, as well as the Sculpt Mold and the Beacon 3-in-1 glue, all in my Amazon Pick of the Week in the description down below. Also, be sure and check for my Micromark promo code and all the other great links that you'll find there in the description. If you'd like to see how I composed this scene and other great Model Railroad content, check out the links on your screen. And be sure and join me on Tuesdays as I bring you even more great Model Railroad videos, and I look forward to seeing you then. Tim, Lizzie?